Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 83 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today my guest will be Coach Greg Nelson, 4th degree Jiu-Jitsu black belt under Pedro Sauer and world-class martial arts instructor and coach. And we'll get to that in just a moment, but let's start off with a quote. And that quote is, The bridge between knowledge and skill is practice. The bridge between skill and mastery is time. And that's from Jim Bouchard. Okay, Coach Greg Nelson has had an incredible martial arts journey. He's a wealth of experience and knowledge and over the years has studied many, many different arts with a host of legendary martial artists. People like Sifu Rick Fay, Master Pedro Sauer, Sensei Nakamura, Master Hickson Gracie, Sensei Eric Paulson, and Grandmaster Chai. He has the distinct honor of being Professor Pedro Sauer's first black belt and as an MMA coach has produced three UFC champions in three different weight classes including Dave Manet who was the first middleweight UFC champion, Sean Shirk who was the second lightweight UFC champion, and Brock Lesnar who was the heavyweight champion. Additionally Coach Nelson has taught defensive tactics to law enforcement and military personnel including the FBI, DEA, and Federal Air Marshals. He also coached the Minnesota National Guard Combatives Team at the All-Army Combatives Tournament in Fort Benning, Georgia. He assisted in the development of an Army Combatives Field Manual and is a civilian member of the Modern Army Combatives Committee, an organization aimed at improving the effectiveness and efficiency of the program. He was also a combatives consultant to the U.S. Army Special Forces Units, 75th Ranger Battalion, U.S. Army Combative School Instructors, and the Naval Special Warfare Development Group, SEAL Team 6. He's also a two-time cancer survivor, and he does talk about that in the interview and share this powerful story about an incredibly difficult time in his life. So I know you're going to enjoy this interview. After the interview, stay tuned for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment, where today's theme will be mental fortitude. All right, without further ado... Let's talk to Coach Nelson now. Okay, I'm speaking with Coach Greg Nelson, fourth degree jiu-jitsu black belt under Pedro Sauer and world-class martial arts instructor and coach. So welcome to the show, sir. Hey, I'm glad to be here. All right. So, man, you've uh, you've pretty much done it all in the martial arts, everything from BJJ to MMA to Kali, JKD, Muay Thai to coaching UFC champs, and along the way have trained with some incredible masters as well. So uh, so how did it all start for you, Greg? Well, I started really martial arts as a kid, and the very first one I ever did was, was judo, but I did it kind of like a kid, so you're just kind of in there goofing around, doing your thing. But it kind of shaped a little bit of a, I guess it planted a seed. And about a year after that, I started wrestling. And that started in seventh grade competitively and did it all the way through junior high, high school, and collegiately 
uh, for uh, two years, and then I injured my knee in the third year, but then I started Greco at the University of Minnesota. But at the same time, about seventh grade, I started getting into martial arts. You know, at first, it was just a bunch of our friends getting together, and some of them are karate guys, and some of them did some boxing, and I did some wrestling, and my brother had taught me how to box. And so we just got together and started training, and that really was the, the spawn of it all. And we really took it seriously. You know, we got together, we were training every day, and doing everything we could to be like martial arts, martial artists, ninjas, everything. You know, we <laughs> right. just got into it. And well, then in 1983, that was really the defining part when I met uh, Rick Fay, hmm. and he's uh, uh, he was already training with Guru Dan and Santo, doing the Kali and the Jun Fan martial arts, and he did Wing Chun as a as a primary martial art. So I met him through a coworker, and we it was just eight guys in a garage at that point at Rick Fay's garage. And that was really the spawn of everything because then I met Achan Shai, so I did Thai boxing. And in 1985, I met, you know, Sifu Francis Fong, and you know, we're I was training with Sifu Larry Hartzell wow. and you know, Tim Tackett, and it just the the list was great of who I was with. So I was just in a in a in a dreamland, put it that yeah, way. Yeah, so many great people back in that time that you, your paths crossed with. And uh, what a great opportunity to be you know, right there at that time. What stands out in your mind the most about that time and that training? Well, I could tell you, I really had a blast going to the, like, the Great Smoky Mountain Camp. And that was the first year I went there. It was in 1985. And that was the first year of the camp. And there were about 30 people that showed up. And that was it. Wow. And it was from Francis Fong, Guru Dan, Achen Chai, Larry Hartzell, Tim Tackett, uh, Graciela Casillas at that point in time. So it was like, basically, they were training right alongside us. So I'd be over there doing tie pads, and there'd be Guru Dan doing tie pads right next to me, and Larry Hartzell holding for him, and Achen Chai, you know, pushing us, and then we go to the next class, and it was just, to me, that was one of my favorite memories at, of that camp, because it was just such a fun time. And that really was, I just started to see how far you could take the martial arts. And of course, Guru Dan is just on the cutting edge of everything. So then you're starting to be introduced to Pensac Sea Lot and then shoot wrestling and, you know, submission wrestling. And so it was just this time where you're just so hungry to learn. And then you have these people right in front of you and you're just, devouring everything you can get and it was it was great what's so cool about that is you know it's at an early stage and it seems like it was very open a lot of cross training a lot of open ideas it wasn't one of these things where someone's in an art and they're pretty closed off and they just want to do that it seems like a real hotbed of you know trading information and training methodologies things like that exactly and at that same time um in when we opened up when Rick Fay opened up the first Minnesota Collie Group and I was training there, uh, that's when Eric Paulson started training with us. And he was 18. And we knew each other from high school, wow. but not from not from uh, martial arts at all, but through gymnastics. Cool. I was a competitive gymnast, and he did gymnastics. And so we knew, knew of each other through gymnastics. So when he walked in, I was saying, hey, I know you. And, uh, <laughs> and so we became, you know, really... I mean, like brothers, and we're like brothers now. And then, you know, he ended, ended up moving out to California, and that's when he just exploded with the grappling. So when I went out there, that's when I, I had it really actually my first taste of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and that was in 1990, I think, 1990, 91, right in that time period. Mm-hmm. I uh, went out there, and I was staying with him and actually living with Achan Chai at the same time, so I was floating around different houses, and uh, he was training, and actually Eric started at, in the garage with uh, the old Gracie garage, and then he was at the original Pico Boulevard Academy, so he got me hooked up to do a private with Hicks and Gracie in 1991, and so I did a private then, did another private, and I was just like, 
oh my gosh, I don't know if I really know anything. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Eric talks uh, a lot about that when he first moved away and went to California and got started out there. So I had him on the show and he goes into that pretty well. Yeah. So what was the first encounter with Hickson like, Master Hickson? What stands out in your mind about those privates? Well, you know, as I remember, back then I was just getting done with my Greco. So I really had this wrestling mindset. Yeah. And and I was still doing submission grappling because we started doing shoot wrestling and shooto. And right. Eric was, you know, obviously everything Eric was getting, we were getting because he'd come back to Minnesota. So we were doing, gra- gra- you know, basic everything. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden I'm doing a private and we started with the most basic of things, right? Just kind of deal with the mount. And he said, okay, what I want you to do is hold me. And, and I mounted him and he just basically like almost just stood up. And I'm like, what just happened here? I mean, didn't even do like a technique. He just stood up. He goes, no, my friend, you got to hold me like I'm a criminal. And I said, okay, I got to hold him down. And he goes, oh, no, my police are coming. I have to get up. And he just literally just, it was like effortless. Oh, that's and I was funny. like, what the heck is going on? So then he kind of showed me a bit about how to post the hands and pull the head, you know, the, the fundamentals of holding mouth. And then he did the same thing with the escape. And then, um, we worked on to just the rear naked choke. And this is what the part I'll probably never forget is that he said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my neck as long as I can. And he, I, here's it called the Mata Leon. You're going to put my hands around the neck. And I kind of knew how to do the rear naked choke. So I, I said, okay. And he, I remember he was sitting there and he goes, my friend, I cannot get my neck any longer. Put it on. <laughs> and so I go, okay, I'm going to choke this guy. Cause he said, I'm going to get a free. <laughs> right. It's on now, right? Yeah. Yep, and so I just started squeezing, just, oh, and he started doing his breathing, and you just hear that. Oh, yes. The next thing you know, his shoulder's coming up, and next thing you know, he's got a hold, and he just throws in front of him and just puts the rear naked choke on it. It felt like my head was going to shoot off like a water rocket. <laughs> and he looks at me, and he goes, it is obvious that you have read a magazine or watched a video. But you do not understand the leverage of the grace you did. And oh, I was wow. just like, oh, my gosh. And I will never forget that as long as I live. That's hilarious. That's wonderful. What a great story. What a great story. So where did it go from there? Well, then, you know, I came, I ended up, you know, came in, I went back to Minnesota, and we are like, okay, we're going to start working jiu-jitsu. And it was really funny because we did the seminar with Paul Vunak, and he was, you know, all about street just the raw essentials of fighting. He was always about the trapping range. And all of a sudden he comes and the entire seminar was almost all great jujitsu. And it was, and he goes, okay, I just met this guy. And of course he probably pseudo challenged Hickson and he got smoked. And so he got taken down. And so everything was groundwork. And he says, if you don't know how to do the ground, you're going to have a hard time. Cause there's, you know, and so he put a little street, bent on it, but it was basically, you know, crazy jujitsu. And it was like, right. so all this stuff was coming together. So we were really focusing on it. And I was starting to do seminars and seek out seminars. So I remember Henzo was in Omaha, Nebraska. So I whipped down to Omaha and trained with him. And, you know, he just, at that time, that was in the early nineties too. And he was just so wired, just, you know, and he's wired now. He's just like really, such a nice guy just like energy like yeah. just unbelievable and so then from then we came back and i started working with some pretty good judo guys who were also guys. and then i went out to california with frank coochie and he said well why don't you go see caesar and health gracie at, at their school in i think it was like mountain view up by san francisco area and so i said okay i went down there and i did a private with with caesar Gracie Mm -hmm. and my and he at that point my my partner that he had come in was Kurt Oziander who was just a a blue belt had short hair no tattoos nothing wow yeah and uh I didn't know who he was and then I remember I took class and this was really the first class that I had a gi on and I was in that school and I did pretty good until I got gi chokes you know so I was doing well and I was fighting the hands and all of a sudden those Hands got on my collar and I got choked. And I was like, ah. all right, that's a new world. 
Right. So that's when I kind of came back and said, okay, we're all going to get geese. And at that time, they were kind of all like judo geese, but we all got the geese and we started just really getting after it. And then I was just, again, trying to seek out as many opportunities to work jiu-jitsu as I can. And then, of course, Eric would come back and, and work both uh, no gi and gi. And then I had uh, an opportunity to work with uh, uh, John, not Donahue, but Don Hugh, who's in uh, Australia. Okay. Right? And so he was in with Rico Ciparelli, who wrestled for the University of Iowa when I was wrestling. He's a national champion, world champion. But he was working with him, so it was like, all right, man, one of the best wrestlers in the world is kind of doing jiu-jitsu as well. This is really wild. So long story short, I then ended up driving out to Frank Cucci school and I was going to stay there for a week. And that's when it was FDC Academy. And that's, and, and at the same time, Professor Sauer was there for a week and that was it. That was it. It was a different, that was it. I mean, how he taught and how he broke things down and how detail oriented he was and how it's just, instead of perfect, my friend, you got it. That's it. He'd be like, okay, now what would that to do? We have to stop right here. <laughs> and then he would break it down. You know, he would, he would not, he was so detail oriented. It was just so awesome. And the, and his whole mannerism and everything. Yeah. And I was like, man, this is the guy right here. Here's, this is who I'm going to stick with. And that's what I've been with ever since. White awesome. belt, blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, black belt, all the way through. Awesome. So that was, you knew right away that that was the person and the, the path for you. Uh, what, yeah. What year was that? That was, I think, 1994. 90, yeah, right in that area, 94, 5. And you uh, were the Master Pedro Sauer's first uh, black belt, right? Yes, wow. yes. What an honor. And, you know, you know, I would say that there was, and I would say this with all honesty, I you know, believe that there was guys that were probably ahead of me in the rank that should have probably got it, but I was in my, kind of my battle of cancer, mm-hmm. and it was like Professor... It's like when you get this, new, you know, how you get a new belt or something happens and it gives you that little boost of energy, whatever it is. Yeah. And he probably could read that and said, okay, well, you know, and I, and I did really well wherever I went to jiu-jitsu. And so that was like that, that little spark that, okay, now I'm a black belt. This is a, I got some more energy here. Let's, let's do this. And it was really, you know, people don't get how those little, those rewards motivate you to keep going you know you know yeah. every little thing helps and he kind of read that and that was that was a big deal wow it just goes to show just how insightful a person he is to hone in on that tell us a little exactly. bit about about that relationship with professor sour over the years you know i uh, started bringing him in for seminar and you know one of the things that i immediately saw that was different from a lot of the other instructors that I, I worked with that he was when it was 10 o'clock when the seminar started that meant he was in his gi belt tied on the floor at 10 o'clock greeting people totally different from a lot of the other where time really doesn't matter i guess mm-hmm. and and i said wow this guy's really professional he's a, he's a little bit different than the other guys in that manner as well not only is he great at technique but he's very professional in how he how he uh acts and his mannerisms and everything and that was really awesome as well and just over those years just you know the ability to look at people break it down how he talks to people is really approachable i mean everything about it makes it so fun to, to be around and he's always it's like every time you're with him something has become a little bit better a little bit more efficient even on the most basic move so I told, when I teach the blue belt test or have people do the blue belt test, I said, you know what? If I did this blue belt test with Professor right now, I would guarantee almost every move he'd be, okay, my friend, let's stop right here. Because <laughs> there, it is always something that he's working on and always sharpening that, that sword all the time. And that's uh, it's such a great thing. And just always have just that nice relationship where you can just talk to somebody about whatever. I remember when I had my first kind of student that was a higher belt kind of leave, and that's right when I was coming back from uh, my cancer. So some of those guys were like, well, we're going to go to our own thing and go under a different instructor. And I'm like, 
wow, I was really bummed out about that. And so I talked to the professor about it, and he goes, well, you know, you know, you can't force anybody to stay. If they don't want to stay, they can't stay. But now, here's the deal. He said, what are they going to say? Because they were like purple belt level. What are they going to say now when they have a purple belt, and that purple belt wants to leave and go to another school? Mm-hmm. And he said, you, what are they going to say? Because if they say anything, he said, well, I'm just doing what you did. Exactly. And so it, it kind of eased up that tension and it, and that you know, worry about that. And I said, yeah, that's right. You know, what are they going to do? If that's the example that they're setting, then, hey, that's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to do. And it's kind of funny because those couple of guys that did end up leaving, they ended up both breaking off from each other, both going to different things, and kind of their whole friendship broke. And then the other guy went from one and then to another instructor. So it's like they just kind of skipped. And you know, I was like, well, I got a solid foundation. I'm staying with this. And this is where I started with. This is what I'm going to end with. And they can bounce around or do what they want. And I just, it doesn't really affect me anymore. That's great. That's great. Wise words from uh, Professor Sauer, because I know it can be disheartening. Exactly. You know, when you have the position you're talking about and you're taking it personal as somebody's leaving. But, uh, yeah, good good wisdom there to uh, keep things in a nice perspective. Definitely. And right now I have no animosity towards any of those guys. You know, I'm just, now I'm like, hey, you're doing I your hope thing, your school right? does really well. Yeah, doing your thing. If your school gets, you know, successful, that'll be more, you know, people to compete against. And so that means we'll have to be on our toes more and we'll have to push our guys more and push our business more. So competition is good. So I have no, uh, no issues with any of those guys now. So we were talking about Eric Paulson. Just saw where he is passing the torch in his organization. Yes, yes. He just uh, kind of gave the fight team to, to Ben. So Jones is uh, this guy has been loyal to him since, for years and years and years. And that kind of frees up Eric so he can train, so he can, you know, do what he wants a little bit more. So right. it's, I know what it's like because, you know, I give up a lot of my time where I could be doing, you know, training in jujitsu. Like when all life goes, I go in with the jujitsu. I have to kind of go back and then head in with my fight team and work with them. And sometimes it'd be like, man, it'd be really fun to go roll in the gi right now. But, you know, it's the, the role I, I, I picked, but I can see where, you know, where he's coming from in that. And, and this is, and it is time where you want to just keep on with your own personal development. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, that's kind of where he's at. Yeah, absolutely. And what a great instructor and leader he is. So he's really certainly made an impact in the martial yeah, arts and for sure. Plus, he's, he'll be teaching at night if those guys are smart they'd be going up to his class at night because they're going to get that just that endless wealth of knowledge because Eric is literally like an encyclopedia of you name it you know locks yes. and this and that and striking and you know just, for sure and and I can yeah. understand at some point wanting to get back kind of a little free up your time to, to focus kind of more what you want to do because sometimes we get so spread out in so many directions and we're giving, giving, giving. We can kind of suffer a little bit as far as what we really want to do ourselves. So Exactly. And when you have a really good guy like uh, like Ben who's, who's really hungry and really wants to be that guy and is fully capable and just a really good coach, mm-hmm. well, then you feel very comfortable handing that off because you know that, hey, it's just the results are going to be the same. Right, absolutely. So let's shift to uh, MMA a little bit for a moment. So you are certainly well-known as one of the best MMA coaches in the world, and you and your team have produced numerous world champions, including three UFC champions, uh, Dave Manet, Sean Shirk, and Brock Lesnar. So first of all, kudos to you for for that. Uh, It's not too many people that can, can say they've come close to that. So I think one of the distinctions with that is, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you had those guys from the start uh, and took them all away. So yep. they didn't inherit them midway through or something like that. Nope. Uh, they came in and uh, all of them had a wrestling background. So they all had a very good base. And, so they, and they all had this incredible work ethic. I mean, there was, these guys were all just driven. And, 
<clears throat> it's really easy to work with somebody when they're so driven and they have their eye on their goal and that's it. And I remember like with Sean, he's very good at jujitsu and he'd train in the gi and, and he, he'd always have this white belt on with four stripes. And I go, Sean, why don't you test for your blue belt? And he goes, right now I have one belt I want and it's gold. And, and that's, that's what he, he was doing in jiu-jitsu, and he was B-rolling. So I said, wow, he probably got one of the world's toughest four-stripe white belts. That's for sure. That's for sure. And, uh, <laughs> and, but that was his, his goal. He wanted to do the gi because he knew there was the value there. And, but he was just focused on what he had to do to win the belt. And what, he used the jiu-jitsu for that specific reason, how to increase his fight skill when it came to uh, MMA. And uh, even even Brock Lesnar, he had a gi, and that thing was huge. I bet. Him and, him and Cole Conrad. And Cole Conrad, bigger than bigger than uh, Brock. And he's uh, he ended up becoming the undefeated Bellator champion. And both those guys had these big, giant gis. And so that was, it was funny, funny, but they were worth it. Yeah. They, were, they were there. Wow. What uh, what is Brock like? You see this persona uh, in the wrestling, WWE, and and even UFC. But what's what's he like in everyday life? He's a very down to earth guy. He's a farmer, so he's kind of just that farmer guy that's really down to earth. But it, he's he's very business. When it's training time, if it starts at ten, everybody's there, wrapped, ready on the mat at ten. There's no excuses. And the, the thing is that what he does, which is very unique, especially in the in the MMA world, is that every one of his training partners, his primary training partners, and of course all the coaches, but even the, the primary training partners are all paid. He pays them all. Mm. But now you're now you're you you're getting paid, you gotta be here. Because if they're not paid, I mean they can show up when they want. Right. Because it's just volunteer. So he picks, he really hand picks the people that he wants and he brings in people that he wants around him that, that will elevate his skill and he feels really comfortable with. And, and once that team is built, it's, it's a team and it's very, it's a very, uh, driven team. And he also is very, very, uh, strict at, you know, what he wants to be said and told because that's all comes from the WWE as well. That, you know, we have a, you know, I don't want people to say what's going on in the camp or what, you know, nothing, nobody has to know about my personal life. That's, that's what is between me and me and you guys. And mm-hmm. if I want to bring it up, that's fine. And so he's very, he tells you exactly, you know, where he's at, what he wants, so that there's not a lot of loose pieces floating around that you could accidentally throw out there you know. right. so he's very and then when there's something that okay we're not saying anything about this okay good enough it said that's smart that it's not open to interpretation because when you leave those details a little fuzzy you know all kinds of things can happen so it's smart that he keys exactly. in so specific as well as smart that in my opinion it's smart that he pays his training partners because like you said then it's it's their job and they look at it a whole different way than yeah, i'm kind of helping out i'm doing this but it's not you know it's different when it's your job yeah, yeah. And it's and he's a again, like I said, a very serious guy, straightforward, but when it's time to relax and joke around, he is he's right in there. He's funny and he's he gets it going. And when you see him up in the ring when he's going like just bonkers, yeah. that is literally an absolute act. Okay. He is he gets done, he walks out, he's just like, Oh, that was good. All he's right. just a true showman, right? Yes. And, and it, it's funny. Uh, it's it, funny. Any plans, if you could share this, I don't know, but any plans of him uh, getting back in the UFC? You know, I don't know, but as soon as uh, he has a play, you know, if he has a desire, he'll, uh, he'll give me a call. I know that, you know, right. so, yeah. And until that happens, he, just, he does his thing. Sure, sure. So when thinking about your uh, your stint as a coach in the uh, MMA world, you know, you've you've had such a high degree of success. What do you contribute? I know you I know you said the champs you worked with are very were very driven and high level of drive, but what would you contribute your success in this area to? Well, I I I've told even my fighters now that are here that 
all the, you know, Dave Benet, Sean Shirk, all those guys were, were class, were products of the classroom. They, they started out, they were in the classroom, they did classes. They didn't think that training should revolve around them. Mm. So they would go to jujitsu class, they'd go to Thai boxing classes, and we'd have our specific fighter training. But if they wanted to become better at Thai boxing, they'd go to Thai boxing class and train right along with the regular students. If they wanted to be, get better at jujitsu, they would go right to the jujitsu class and, and train right along with the regular students. And so they were very uh, smart in that way because they, they, didn't, they didn't see themselves as some separate entity that everybody was there to worship or, or yeah. to train, which it seems like there's a lot of, seems a lot of that going around. Like yeah. guys will come in and say, well, I'd like to do this because I'm a fighter. And I'm like, well, what do you mean you're a fighter? Well, I'm, you know, I'm an MMA fighter. And I'm like, well, that's great. So you're going to start in our jujitsu class. Well, I don't want to do that. And I go, well, there's a lot of gyms that go to that. Because, you know, you're not some kind of individual that's just going to pop in and just do whatever you want. Right. Like, you know, you're lucky you have it, right? Yeah, and it's, it's, it cracks me up. And they all pay. There's no no free ride. So I said, no. And, and I said, well, what do you mean i got to pay? I'm a fighter. I said, oh, so you're done learning. <laughs> and they go, what? I said, well, are you, are you done learning then? Well, no. And I said, well, then if you're in a school and you're learning, what does that make you? I said, I'll give you a word. It's called a student. Right, right. All right? You're still a student of the game. So as long as you're there, you're no different than the, the high-level executive that's making 10 times the amount of money that you'll ever make in fighting. You know, what makes you think you're better than that guy or, or, or whoever's in this school? So I've, I've shut that door right away to all those people that think they're going to come in and be some kind of prima donna <laughs> yeah. or you know, whatever the deal is, I don't know. But yeah, so people come in, they train. And I, I tell the fighters too, I said, we have a big school here. So we have, if you have a local fight and you can't sell tickets in a school that has, you know, 500 people, you got a problem. You got mm -hmm. some kind of personality problem that's not working because you got a bunch of ready made fans right here and you can't make it happen. You got to be nice. You got to work with the people. You got to be personable. I said, this is just like practice for when you're in uh, the next level of fighting where you have to communicate with the fans and all these other people. You know, you want to be that person that people want to want to watch because you're you're a great fighter and that you're you know, you're a, you're a fan favorite. Mm -hmm. I said, I said, so here's where it starts right here. So anybody that's going to ruffle the feathers here, you're probably going to either told to chill or hit the door because we don't need you here. So I'm pretty, you know, I don't let just a bunch of knuckleheads come in and, and train MMA. I don't care how good you are. If you're not a person that wants to train with the class and better themselves and be a, a part of our school, then we don't really need you. Yeah, I love how you set the stage, you know, right from the start and it's good that you don't let anybody come in and kind of be, you know, the, the prima donna. What do you think is the most important or some of the most important things to think about with the gym or academy culture when you're setting that up for everybody? Well, I mean, for us, the, we, we've made a big change a few years ago, uh, probably about, I don't know, six, maybe even more years ago. Uh, prior to that, when I first opened, at first it was all about just competitors, high-level competitors who wanted to push that level. And I was working 40 hours a week job and just coming in and had a gym for just high-level guys who wanted to push, 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 and grind. And then it just comes to the point where you're like, man, I don't really want to work at the, there's a job, but there's only so many people that want to push it to that level. So over the years, it's slowly but surely kind of we've made things a little bit easier, but we still had this this reputation as a, being a fighter school. So you know, in that time, we were called Minnesota Martial Arts Academy, and even that, we, it was MMAA, Minnesota Martial Arts Academy, 
But everybody would say, oh, you, you train at MMAA, mit, you know, Mixed Martial Arts Academy. And I go, no, it's Minnesota Martial Arts Academy. Oh, Minnesota Mixed Martial Arts Academy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, you know, so that became, you know, synonymous with who we are with fighters. And so that would immediately you know, turn away a lot of people that may want to do the martial arts that really need the martial arts. So we kind of revamped the whole thing. We changed our color scheme. We, we just stopped with the Minnesota Martial Arts Academy. It just became the Academy. And we had a, we had now have a new logo and immediately we started to change the, the culture that, you know, we still have our fight teams, but those are like our advanced students are the same thing. So what we wanted, wanted to do is make our initial foundations class. So, um, just so, uh, easy that anybody could do it. Mm -hmm. Anybody coming off the street, regardless if you've even done any kind of, training in the world you can do our foundations class and then if uh once you you have that then you can go up to the next level if you want to cap which is our combat athlete program and then go from there to you know if you wanted to compete that's up to you but the whole thing is we want to make it a very open friendly environment and another thing that really changed my whole mindset was when i came back from my cancer I could no longer do a lot of things that I used to be able to do. I was, you know, all American gymnast, you know, collegiate wrestler. Everything came really easy to me. I could see a move and just do it. So when I'd see somebody trying to do the shrimp and their feet would slip, you know, and you go, how can this person not do the shrimp? It's like the easiest thing in the world. And then I came back from cancer because I lost my ability to use my legs. So I had to relearn how to walk and everything. And I became the person that I used to make fun of. And I go, oh, my. Now I see from their foot, from their point of view. Mm, and it wow. gave me an entirely different empathy towards people who couldn't do things because they just didn't have the athleticism. And it was really because I was that person. I had, you know, from relearning how to walk, that was relearning how to do almost everything. And my feet didn't have the same feel. My nerves couldn't. You know, just the whole athleticism thing was just dropped down to a big, almost to a zero at one point. So it, it shifted my whole body, my whole mindset. It's like, wow, we need to make this school open to those people that really need the martial arts. And those are the people that are kind of the weakest and the most non-athletic that are most likely the ones that if someone is going to attack, they're going to attack those type of people because right. they're easy to attack. Very true. So... And that and that was a big mental shift, and that's what I wanted to uh, kind of kind of spread throughout the school, and and right now we have just and it really made a big difference as oh, far as uh, bringing bringing so many different types of people in and making them comfortable and having an, a place for them to train and and instructors that are there right for them and and of course they could stay a little bit longer and see the higher level classes and even the fight teams compete and go, wow, that's a, that's a different level. I don't know if I'll ever do that. Right, go, right. Hey, you never know. You never know. I think it's great that you um, got to the place, you know, where you broadened it and you made it accessible for a lot of different people, different walks of life and that kind of thing. I think it's just a smart and great thing to do. I'm sorry it took cancer to give you that revelation, but I'm, I think it's a very sound approach and thing to do. But let's talk a little bit about your cancer. You are a two-time cancer survivor, and the first time, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then yep. later on, you survived a rare form of nerve cancer called neurolymphomatosis, so, and how long was it between yep. those two, and just tell us a little bit about those battles and how that was. Well, I'll start it from the, from the beginning. I remember uh, I was initially felt it when I was actually running up a mountain in Thailand, and myself and Matt McIntyre, one of the other coaches and at the school. And all of a sudden I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta stop. And he just looked at me like, what? Cause I was a really endurance based athlete. Just go, 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 go. And I go, yeah, I got, I, I don't know. My ankle hurts a little bit, you know, but just keep going. I'll get, I'll catch up with you. And he goes, okay. And I remember I was like, wow, is that, what it means to be like 36, you get tired already. 
and kept pushing it, kept kind of putting it off, but it felt like I was getting just like worn down and things started to become a little bit more labored. Then all of a sudden my back started to hurt and I started getting all this pain and wherever your lymph nodes are, right? So under my armpits and under my jaw and my back and just everything started to hurt. And then I remember there was a specific time of Professor Sauer was there and he, he knew the intensity that I grappled at. And all of a sudden I, I remember just telling him, you know, I'm going to sit this one out. This, I'm going to sit this session out. And he's like, oh, you feel a little bit? Yeah, I just don't feel so good. You know, so I'm just going to sit this one out. And I remember he, he still remembers that going, yeah, that was so strange because you were always just the first one on and the last one off. And shortly thereafter, you know, I went into the doctor and they misdiagnosed me and then misdiagnosed again, misdiagnosed again. And then finally it was to the point where I was, I would just kind of pass out behind the desk and just like fall asleep, just trying to do anything to get away from the, the pain in my back. And so the guys would teach and my wife finally called the doctor. My wife then said, listen, you got to do a scan or I'm, I'm going to find my husband dead on, the, on my floor. And so I went in, did the scan and they called back and said, Hey, just get to the hospital. We found out, we found some stuff out. So I went there and then I remember getting off the elevator fourth floor and this said oncology and I go ah there it is wow. and it funny thing is it was actually a relief to know that okay there's an opponent to fight I have something to fight now and so I went in there and what had happened is that large B cell uh, lymphoma and what it was is stage four liver cancer wow. so I had two tumors on my liver and a liver and I had a tumor on my spleen so it went outside my liver as well and it's now in my lymph system. And at that point, there was about, you know, maybe a very small, like 4 8% survival rate. Mm-hmm. That's... And, and I, and, but I told, I told the doctors, told V, who was my wife at that time, I said, I don't want to hear numbers and statistics. I just want to hear what we got to do, right? Because the statistics bring in people who've never exercise a day in their life and right. they just give up and die. So That's I don't true. want to hear those numbers. Just give me the, give me the stuff. And so they did a biopsy and said all this stuff that had to happen. And so I went, ended up doing six months of chemo and went from pretty much a steady weight of about 155 pounds down to about 135 pounds, which was my wrestling weight in college. So I immediately lost like 20 some pounds and Battled through that one. And then between my fifth and sixth chemo, I started getting all this pain in my legs. And uh, it started drifting down, right down my back of my leg. And, it, you know, got through, found out that I was in full remission from the liver cancer. And that this pain might be an infection from the chemo. Because a lot of times there's an infection that can happen in the nerves because of the chemo. Because you're, you know, your whole immune system is shut down. Mm-hmm. And so they, they kept monitoring it. But then I, I started, uh, the pain started getting like unbearable and I started uh, losing the ability to use my legs. I'd start walking, I'd trip, my foot would drop and then uh, got worse to the point where I'd just be crawling around my room. I could really have a hard time walking. And eventually the doctors in Minnesota, uh, up where I was, they just had no idea what was going on. I was getting methotrexate injections in my spine because they thought maybe the lymphoma was going into my my spine. And, you know, so you're bending over and they're doing basically like spinal taps and putting methotrexate in, taking fluid out, put some methotrexate in. And it would go away for like a few days, but then it would come back worse than what it was. So I went down to Rochester Mayo Hospital, which is fortunately in Minnesota, and it's a very famous hospital. And walked in and didn't leave for six months. Wow. And while I was there, I was 100% invalid. Could not move anything from the waist down. And the pain was, you know, it's kind of indescribable. I already described pain. But to put it this way, the, the pain doctor that 
I had there, which I see you know, every once in a while, he said that at that point and, and now that the pain that I had has, is now the standard for what they use for what people can bear. Wow. And they said it was worse than a burn unit. Oh, my god! Because it was nonstop for six months. So it got to the point where morphine and the lot did no longer work because I'd stopped breathing and because they were giving me so much. And so they, they had to put me on like 48 hour ketamine drips and, you know, just, they didn't know what was going on. They did, they could, there was no scans that were showing up. And finally they found a, a high powered MRI imaging. And they saw that my left sciatic nerve was bigger and brighter than my right one. So they went into the biopsy of my serial nerve, which is down by your ankle and Achilles and they didn't find anything. So then one of the top peripheral neurosurgeons did a biopsy on my sciatic nerve, which was like a pretty extensive operation because they have to separate sensory nerves from motor nerves because they pluck a motor nerve. That's it. Whatever they pluck is gone. Mm -hmm. And they have to regrow and they don't really regrow that well. And so they uh, found that the lymphoma had went into my sciatic nervous system. So it was attacking my nervous system. And at that point in time, there, there had only been 33, 33 known cases of neural lymphomatosis. And out of those 33, there were zero survivors. Wow. They all died of the pain. Oh, my God. And so kind of had the ability just from all the fighting and martial arts and Thai boxing and wrestling and jiu-jitsu and just that really high pace and high you know, threshold of pain that I had. I was like the guinea pig that lived. And so they were able to push and prod and do what they had to do. And they said, okay, uh, we have one alternative here. It's a stem cell transplant, full body stem cell transplant. So we're going to, fortunately, because it's not in your blood system, we can get the stem cells from your blood. And so in about four days, they got 5 million stem cells. And then they just doused me with chemo. The first chemo didn't work. Second chemo didn't work. And then the third one, I don't know, they made some concoction up. And that one worked. And then they just uh, gave me a stem cell transplant. And from being a six month of 100% invalid, the third day after I had my stem cell transplant, I was already getting up onto my feet and walking with a walker. And then about seven days, I was able to walk from my bed to the door and then get to the walker. And then I just, you know, doing the whole parallel bars thing, really learning how to walk. I remember taking my first three steps up three stairs and then back down. And then my first 100 steps for the walker. I mean, just all these milestones. Wow. And it took about a full year to learn how to walk completely, which was, uh, you know, they, cause they didn't know. They didn't have any other data after yeah, that. No one had survived. What happened? Yeah. And they, they were thinking that I would never walk again. And they didn't know what was going to happen. And I, and I remember telling, I don't remember telling them, but they told, told me that in the nerve, uh, in the biopsy, they said, well, you might come out of there paralyzed because we don't know what the extent of the damage. And I go, I'm paralyzed already. I'll just play murder ball. <laughs> and they, and they kind of cracked up because I don't remember saying that, but I said, <laughs> I never must have saw some program when playing murder ball, guys in a wheelchair doing a basketball. And I say, I'll do that. I don't oh, care. Man. Just give me my, I want to see my kids grow up because yeah. I had my son Gunner was two and my daughter Nina was five. So there's a lot of motivation, a lot of drive, a lot of fight. And I had a lot of help from all the people around the world that were praying and sending their vibe, you know, good vibes and all my students coming down and visiting and, and you know, all my instructors that were behind me. So, you know, I had a lot of support and that really helped. I mean, people don't really, I mean, well, they know that actually, that when people pray and, and, and are showing support, it, they, they've shown that it, mm -hmm. it helps people survive. Oh, completely. So. And they've done many studies that certainly show that for sure. So it's hugely important. But, man, what an incredible, incredible story. I can't even imagine what that must have been like for you. I mean, uh, any kind of cancer you know, it's terrible, but my gosh, you sure have been through it. And it just shows what a true fighter you are, you know, on and off the mat. So, man, uh, my heart goes out to you for sure. 
do all sort of things I you know, try to pass on to both my, my son and my daughter and as many people as I can. I mean, you just really have to have that never give in, never give up, never quit attitude. And I remember saying, hey, I'll just fight until I die, but I'm not just going to die. You know, I'm going to fight. If it, if it happens, it happens. You know, you know, for me, I had a, a pretty strong faith and there was a lot of deep, you know, tough times where you get these negative thoughts that bombard you, like you're not going to see your kids grow up, you're going to die, you know, and when you have those thoughts, you either got to, you got to fight them or they're just going to take it over. And, you know, from sports psychology and other stuff, you know, you can only think of one thing at a time. So I'd either focus on a verse or a saying, because I was really big into collecting sayings ever since I was like in eighth grade. And uh, so I had memorized it a whole bunch. And I would just say them over and over and over. So that's all I'd be thinking about instead of those negative thoughts that would bombard you. And, you know, when you're, you know, alone at night and you, you're just, you're in a bunch of pain and you can't sleep. And then all of a sudden these thoughts come and you let them get you. I mean, that's, 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 I think where a lot of people start to lose. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to fill that up with just that, that positive, you know, intention and positive thought. So you really use the power of the mind to, to positively program yourself for success. Do you have one or two of those sayings that you remember that might have been instrumental in that time for you? Well, I mean, sometimes it was simply only a word, but I remember, you know, there was always a, there was one that I thought was always funny because I remember it because so many of the, what I, I used to every day put a new saying up on the high school wall when I was a gymnast, mm -hmm. every day I'd put a new new one. And there was one that says we can re we can uh, rejoice because thorn bushes have roses or be bummed out because rose bushes have thorns. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's and so true. I'd be, I'd be kind of saying stuff like that over. And I remember saying that one a lot because that, that when I was cracking up because all the football players would be like, oh, man, it was, it was so lame, you know. And I go, well, whatever. <laughs> Do your thing. That's great. That's great. And uh, so, yeah, it was just stuff like that that would, you know, you'd have to focus on. And, you know, because if you, if you let that, the negative stuff get to you, it, it's, it's really, uh, it can take over just yeah. like the positive stuff. That's right. So. It'll destroy you if you let it, right? Yep. So you mentioned your, uh, your children. I'm sure that they really benefited by seeing, you know, your power of your mind in action and that never quit attitude. That undoubtedly have served them well and really set them up to look at things a certain way for their life. So that's, that's great that you had that effect. How old are they now, your, your kids? My daughter's going to be 20 coming up, and she's her second year in, at college at the University of Iowa. And my son just turned 17 in September here, and he uh, is 11th grader now. So he's uh, wrestling and Nice. He does. He, I mean, he helps teach the jujitsu class for the kids, and helps teach Thai boxing class for the kids. And his job is he cleans the gym, and then he helps teach afterwards. And so he's staying with the martial arts, and uh, so it's really good. And my my daughter, you know, obviously grew up doing martial arts too, but she was a very competitive gymnast, and was uh, you know, level ten, you know, national competitive gymnast all around. You go all around the country, and and then. Uh, you know, she had, you know, scholarship offers as well, but, you know, I could see that there was, you know, that flame was flickering a little bit because she was literally has been doing gymnastics, you know, and she was 18 for 16 years of her life when she was 18. So I go, I remember asking her, I said, Nina, do you really want to do gymnastics in college? I mean, is that what you want to do more than anything? And she kind of looked down and said, well, and I go, oh, that's it. <laughs> nope. If you have to think about it, right. it's over. And I could tell that she was really kind of relieved. I think she was waiting for me to give the okay, you know, because she was so competitive. And that would come out even when she would do grappling tournaments because she was practicing 20 hours a week in gymnastics. And, uh, you know, all through high school and even as a, probably since about the age of 11, that's when she started probably going 15, 20 hours a week. And, I say, hey Nina, the submission hunt's coming up. That's a tournament that we put on. You should probably go do a jujitsu class before you do it. And she go, okay. And she'd do a jujitsu class, one class, and then she'd go in and she'd either win it or there was one other 
son of another school owner that would beat her, and she would get so mad if she did beat her. I go, Nina, how can you be so mad you took one jiu-jitsu right, class? Right. But it was that competitiveness and that you know fact that she was training 20 hours a week. With that, because she grew up kind of doing gymnast- or doing jiu-jitsu as well as all the other stuff, yeah. she was able just to just go right into it. Wow, so, that's great. So, Greg... Is there anything that comes to mind that uh, people may be surprised to learn about you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, it's probably not a big surprise, but I'm really into the, obviously, all, all parts of learning. So I, I always do, I, I go to different places. I just got back from uh, High Performance Academy Live. It's a uh, uh, big you know, high performance for executives, for authors, for entrepreneurs, for whatever. And that was just four days long. And that was in San Diego. And it was really wild because, you know, you're around people totally outside your circle. They might be realtors or authors or you know, high level executives or doing whatever, but they're all high performers. And to me, it's all about what you can bring back and how you can apply it back to your school and your instructors and, and everybody else. So I, I'm doing that. And then I have a, a big school that, or training that I'll be doing in November again, which is a public speaking course. So going out and doing public speaking and getting out in front of people and, and being able to you know, kind of do a little bit more than the martial arts. My goal is to also start to take people from maybe all areas and help them become higher performers in whatever they do. That's and cool. you know, taking from my experiences from just the athletics and the martial arts and battling cancer and producing athletes and working with, you know, all different types of people from all different walks of life. And, you know, people who never thought they'd be able to be in there rolling live or sparring or doing anything. Next thing you know, they're doing it. And they just, you know, so how to maybe pass that along a little bit more to people of all different areas. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm focusing on as well, is expanding my martial arts and expanding that whole high performance mentality mm-hmm. and lifestyle. Yeah, it sounds like what you're really talking about is empowerment and empowering people. And, of course, on the mats or the cage, but also in other parts of life. And you certainly have the background and experience, life experience to certainly lead people into that higher realm and, and to empower them. So hats off to you for deciding to take it to an even higher level and make a bigger difference. So much respect, sir. Oh, thank you very much. I also you know, try to, and this has just been a byproduct of obviously the cancer, but I, I've had, and sometimes it's kind of really, a, it's tough, but I deal with a lot of people that have cancer or they're, relative has cancer and I end up have you know talking to them or like the tough ones are like hey you know one of my friends just found out that his 15 year old son has xyz cancer could you talk to him and it's like yeah no problem i'll talk to him and you know when you have to kind of really motivate yourself and muster up you know your your positive intentions because you you know what the kid's going to go through and it's just going to be a, a battle like he's never had and he's 15 years old, and I couldn't imagine at 15 having to put your life on hold to do that. But, you know, to me, I, I see it as another way to how can I give back and how can I use this really, you know, part of my life that was obviously, you know, very negative. But how can I use it to to help out and build people up that are going through the same thing or or do anything? Just give them a spark, whatever it is. And if I can do anything to help that battle to, to allow them to win. You know, I'll do it. I'll be there. Awesome. Being a true advocate for them. So that's wonderful. Wonderful. One thing I'm excited about is in the near future, you'll be coming to North Carolina for November 4th to do two seminars. And the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast is co-sponsoring with uh, Professor Mark Kukro and Integrated Martial Arts Academy. So I'm excited very much to be in attendance to that. And uh, for any listeners who are hearing this and are interested in going, you can get a discount by just mentioning that you heard about it on the uh, the show. So I'll be uh, posting a link to it in the show notes. So certainly make plans to uh, 
to see Coach Nelson there. Yeah, I'm really, really excited. I met uh, Mark down in Brazil at Pedro Sauer's camp. Uh, awesome. And uh, and so that was awesome. I got to meet him there, and, and uh, it was really fun. We got to do a lot of fun stuff down there, and it's you know such a great environment. You know, obviously you're in the birthplace of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but you're with Professor Sauer, and in camp you get to go visit other schools, you get to see Brazil, and it was really nice to meet People like Mark, who are really professional uh, jiu-jitsu instructors, but not only that, but he's just such a, a, a high-minded, you know, martial arts business consultant as well. So it's really great to meet people of of his caliber and just to be able to continue on with that relationship and go down there and you know teach at his school and and you know kind of share what I have. That's that's. That's what this is all about. Absolutely. Yeah, Mark's an exceptional human being, and I'm, I'm grateful that, that I'm able to spend time with him as well. Yeah, we're both very excited about you coming and looking forward to it. Before we close, do you have anybody you want to uh, do a shout-out to or thank or anything like that or any parting words, Greg? Well, of course, you know, I, I always want to give thanks for, to uh, Professor Pedro Sauer. Uh, he has been, you know, there through thick and thin, uh, and I remember even when I was going through my cancer and, and wasn't able to teach, but I had people that could teach for me. But he was like, man, I can come out there and teach for two weeks at a time if you need. And I was like, oh, you know, Professor, because I have people and you have to do your stuff. You know, you have your own school and you're doing your seminars. But the fact that he was, you know, offering his time to come out, I mean, that's, that was huge. And so, you know, he's my... He's my professor. I mean, that's who I look up to as far as my, you know, all my training goes in jiu-jitsu. And he's also opened the doors to meet a lot of other people. And his attitude is so great with that, you know, that, uh, you know, it, it just helps our whole program. And I'd like to, you know, obviously give a, a, a shout-out to all my other Peter Sauer affiliates. You know, Frank Cucci, who actually introduced me to Professor Sauer, who is a phenomenal jiu-jitsu you know, practitioner in his own right. I mean, he is this, uh, he's, he is phenomenal. So I got those guys, you know, I always have to give a shout out to Sifu Rick Bay, my original instructor who gave me the, the start to meet everybody. Guru Dan Anasanto, Achan Chai, Jason Francis Fong, you know, all my instructors, you know, it all started with, uh, you know, Sifu Rick Bay up here in, in Minnesota. And of course, all my staff and students at the academy, you know, without them, I mean, they kept that school running for almost two years while I was battling cancer. And they were there to be thick and thin. And those, the, the, you know, Andy Gron and Matt McIntyre, who run my school, they are, they've been there through everything. So I can't give enough to them and all my students and staff. So I uh, always want to give a shout out to them. So you're a class act for sure, and I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me today, and thank you for letting us know more about uh, your life, and you've really impacted a lot of lives and, and uh, will continue doing so going forward. So again, much, much respect to you, and I wish you uh, nothing but a long, healthy, and happy life, sir. Oh, thank you very much, and, and to you as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, really enjoyed that interview with Coach Nelson. After the interview completed, we continued speaking for a bit and discussed many things such as breathing, brain science, and taking people to the next level, both on and off the mat. So really enjoyed that uh, conversation. What a very, very interesting person he is. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago in the interview, we have the seminars coming up with Coach Nelson November 4th, and until October 18th, you can take advantage of the early registration. This is our first time having Coach Nelson in, so we intentionally made it uh, just very, very affordable. Mark and I had that as an intention, to make it just as affordable as possible. And if you take advantage of the early registration, you're going to get a really, really good deal. So I encourage you to register today and make plans to attend this awesome event. Okay, as many of you know, we recently started a Patreon page, 
where you can show your support for the show. And I wanted to shout out to Houston Cottrell and Jim Pfeiffer and Richard W., who are our first three patrons. And thank you guys very much. Really appreciate that support. Can't say enough about what that means. Thank you. All right, up next is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And today we're featuring an audio clip of a very powerful video of a speech made by Naval Admiral William McRaven, and it's on mental fortitude. So I know you're going to enjoy that, so stay tuned for that now. making your bed if you make your bed every morning you will have accomplished the first task of the day it will give you a small sense of pride and it will encourage you to do another task and another and another and by the end of the day that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter if you can't do the little things right you'll never be able to do the big things right And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. To pass SEAL training, there are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark, at least not that they can remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if a shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout, and he will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys. The Munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The Munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh, swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart not by the size of their flippers. The ninth week of training is referred to as Hell Week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day at the Mud Flats. The Mud Flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana where the water runs off and creates the Tijuana Sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain where the mud will engulf you. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week but you paddle down in the mud flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive the freezing cold, the howling wind, and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man until there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, 
and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent that some students were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up. Eight more hours of bone-chilling cold. The chattering teeth and the shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great enthusiasm. One voice became two, and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted, and somehow the mud seemed a little warmer, and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope. The power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start each day with a task completed. Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you take some risks, step up when the times are the toughest, face down the bullies, lift up the downtrodden, and never, ever give up. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you feel like you're benefiting from the show and want to show your support, you can support us on our Patreon page and a link in the show notes. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat. <laughs>